All right, Alexander, let's do an update as to what is going on in Ukraine. Um, let's start perhaps with the situation on the front lines, uh, more Russian advances going on throughout the, the front lines. We could talk about, uh, maybe you want to talk about Davdivka, Kupiansk. There seems to be more activity in, in these areas, or at least more news coming out from these areas. And uh, then we can uh, talk about uh, Putin, I guess, his his speech, his appearance in St. Petersburg, and some very interesting uh, statements and uh, speeches that he gave. So uh, let's let's start with the situation on the front. Well, indeed, I mean, let's start because it is, we're seeing more of the same, only a lot more of the same in the sense that the Russians are intensifying their pressure. And it, it, it's fascinating to see if you if you keep track of what's going on in the war, um, the Russians advance in one place, the Ukrainians pull together reinforcements and try to stop that Russian advance. They take very very heavy losses, and Ukrainian losses apparently are spiking. Um, there was one Ukrainian um, source that said that they're losing men now at the rate of twelve hundred a day. 1,200 a day. Now, these are not dead. These are dead and heavily wounded. But that's what, you know, is coming out of Ukraine at the moment. So the Russians attack in one place. The Ukrainians, as I said, try and reinforce there. They pull troops from various other parts of the front line. And then the Russians increase the pressure elsewhere. And they're doing this everywhere. They're doing this all the time. So they're now pushing very hard in Kupiansk. The Ukrainians stop the Russian advances near Kupiansk city. They block the Russians for several weeks at a place called Sinkovka. There was a lot of heavy fighting there. The Ukrainians apparently took a big hammering in Sinkovka. The Russians have their losses also, but they can absorb losses. Anyway, the Ukrainians then started to sort of breathe. And then, of course, the Russians attacked um, in other places close to Kupians, um on the um, um, various uh, oh, string of villages is now apparently falling under Russian control. And they're pushing hard towards the Oskol River. And it looks like they're working towards bypassing Sinkovka from uh, the south, even as they're apparently renewing their attack on Sinkovka. And again, one hears reports that the Ukrainians are getting very desperate, that they're now starting to create defences within Kupiansk itself, that they're evacuating people from nearby areas, and it looks like some kind of a crisis is developing there. And this is happening. This is, remember, Kupiansk is in Kharkiv region. More and more reports now that the Russians are um, putting pressure on various parts, places in Kharkiv region. There are reports which are impossible to verify and which may not be true, but which do point to um, increased Russian activity. They're the reports which we can't verify is that the Russians have actually crossed the border into Kharkiv region from the north and have captured a village and have now moved on and have captured a town called Volchansk. I mean, I'm not sure this is correct, but the fact that these rumours are circulating at all tells us that the Russians are very active on the border now. They're sending uh, apparently reconnaissance teams across the border all the time. They're forcing the Ukrainians to say to themselves, are the Russians intending to launch an offensive here? Are they? Can we afford to divert troops to hold the positions in um, Kupiansk, what do we do? Um, and again, a sense of gathering crisis. They must be very uncertain about what's going on. The Russians keeping them guessing. And then the Russians attacking in other places also. So they're attacking very hard in Bakhmut. Again, it's important to stress, it's a point we've made many times, only a fraction of the Russian army is involved in these attacks up to now. But again, the Russians pushing hard in Bakhmut, moving steadily closer towards 
Chas of Hyar. They're in the process now, apparently, of um, storming two villages, Bogdanovka and Ivanivska, to the west of Bakhmut, which the Wagner organization never captured. And that's one area of crisis. And then a little further to the south of that, we come to Avdevka. And the situation of Devka, very, very critical. The Russians were able to capture uh, various fortified positions that the Ukrainians had created in the south of Avdevka. There apparently fighting going on within Avdevka itself in this area. The Ukrainians trying to counterattack, suffering enormously heavy losses in doing so. They're trying to move troops into Avdevka to push the Russians back. That means that the Russians can bomb them, which is exactly what they're doing with their air force. That means the Ukrainians suffering very heavy losses there. And the Russians at the same time, and one senses that because the Ukrainians are having to worry about the situation in Avdeevka itself, they're pulling troops from other places on the Avdeevka front lines. And the result is that the Russians are making further advances in other places, there's a village called Pervomaisky that they're in the process of capturing. They're advancing in the north towards a place called Keramik, which is also in the Avdevka area. They're gradually threatening to close the bag. It's a very complex battle. But again, one senses Ukraine suffering heavy losses there as well. And you go further south still, same stories, now a, a return to fighting near Rabotino. Remember that place? Ukrainians spent enormous efforts, resources trying to capture it in the summer. Fighting has returned to Rabotino. Russians are threatening to capture Rabotino. Ukrainians need to make a decision. Do they hold on to Rabotino or do they defend themselves there? They're sending troops to try to hold on because, of course, if the Russians fully recapture Rabotino, it will be a major blow to Zelensky's prestige, to Ukraine's prestige, it reverse everything that was achieved during the summer offensive. Not that anything of substance was achieved during the summer offensive, but, you know, the prestige of that will be bad. So, uh, again, reinforcing failure by defending um, ground that was of no use to them, but lending themselves by doing that to this strategy of attrition that the Russians are imposing upon them. And the same again in Herthon region. Uh, they're clinging on, apparently they're now on the shoreline in Klinki, but they're not actually pulling people back from Klinki. And they're trying to support the people who are in Klinki by keeping more troops on the west bank of the river, where again, the Russians can bomb them, which is precisely what the Russians are doing. So, expending reserves, expending ammunition stocks, burning up their drones, and the Russians are becoming apparently getting closer all the time to a situation when they can start to jam Ukrainian drones. We're starting to hear the first hints that this is going to, that this is happening um, on an ever bigger scale. And we'll probably see that also happen before long. And reports now in the British media that the Ukrainians have only one month of ammunition stocks left by the end of February, even if they conserve ammunition. And they're only using ammunition at very limited levels at the moment. But unless they get major infusions of more ammunition supplied to them, um, their uh, ammunition supply situations by the end of February will become critical, which is, again, exactly what the Russians are working to achieve. So you can see um, what I've called aggressive attrition, how it works. You don't aim for major breakthroughs. You press the Ukrainians all the time. You make them lose men. You make them expend machines and ammunition. And at some point, when the Ukrainians are sufficiently weakened, I myself believe that the big blow will come. Apparently, in Ukraine, they're already worrying that it will come this summer. And there's a lot of talk about this in Ukraine. Um, and um, effectively, admissions, 
that when it does come, Ukraine won't have the force or the strength to withstand it. Yeah. Um, what do you make of, before we get to Putin and uh, St. Petersburg, what do you make of the reports from uh, the, I believe it was the New York Times or the Washington Post, maybe both, uh, where they claim that the Biden White House is now uh, pressing uh, Ukraine to change their, their strategy to, to rebuild in 2024, to build defensive lines, to build their own Sudovican line, and uh, for, for Ukraine to go into active defense operations, to, to husband their resources, build defenses, uh, not go on any offensives, not go on the offense, and to build their their uh, their resources and, and husband their resources for a big push in 2025. Yeah, exactly. They're basically, there's the, the, the White House strategy is everything that Russia did in 2023 for Ukraine to do in 2024. Yeah. But then what do you make of those reports? I mean, the first thing to say is that this is not a, 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 you know, a clever plan. It is an admission of the reality. I mean, the fact is, Ukraine is not in a position to launch offensives now. So why even talk about them? I mean, you know, talking about a cunning plan to go on the defensive rather than launch an offensive, another renewed Ukrainian offensive, is to imply that Ukraine has a choice, <laughs> that it can either choose to remain on the defensive or choose to go on the offensive. It doesn't have that choice. Its forces have lost the initiative right across the front line, and the Russians are advancing. And it's taking everything the Ukrainians have got to hold the Russians back. You can't seriously think about an offensive in this kind of situation. So what we're seeing is that all of the other various cunning plans that we've heard, you know, the great Herson offensive that was going to happen across the Dnieper, well, that's failed. So we're now abandoning that. We're reverting to the earlier plan build a Surovikin line, Surovikin type line. No sign, by the way, of that being done in any serious way by Ukraine. And it just doesn't have the resources to create something analogous to the Surovikin line. We try and build something like the Surovikin line and uh, go on the defensive because they have no choice but to stay on the defensive because we can't provide them with many more shells because we haven't got any shells to provide. The F-16 deliveries are being postponed continuously because Ukraine isn't ready to operate them. We're becoming increasingly short of air defense missiles. I mean, we're coming up with fantasies about creating air defense bubbles over Ukrainian cities, which, I mean, there just aren't the missiles available to do that. And it's now becoming increasingly clear that Russian hypersonic missiles can easily penetrate Ukrainian defences, wherever air defences, wherever the Russians want to strike. So, you know, you spin all of this, you pretend that this is a new plan in order to tell the American people, well, actually, you know, America, Ukraine isn't losing. It's not been forced back. It's not on the back foot. It's all really some cunning plan. We are uh, actually conserving Ukraine, Ukraine's forces so that we can go back on the attack in 2025, when the election is conveniently over. And in the meantime, we cross our fingers and hope that Ukraine can somehow hold things together until the election is out of the way. I mean, that, that is the strategy. And as I said, this is, this is spin. Um, I, I, if you look at that article, which I, was in the Washington Post, by the way, I mean, one of the, uh, one of the extraordinary things about it is the enormous amount of fantasy that is there at the same time, you know, talking about bubbles, air defense bubbles around Ukrainian cities of starting military industrial production in Ukraine, all this kind of thing. I don't think anybody who is familiar with the realities of the war believes this any longer. But it's it's a story that they can say, Biden can say on the campaign trail, or so they hope. Even as, as I said, it's the Russians who are now actually dictating the situation on the battlefield. And uh, even as also they keep their fingers crossed and hope that there isn't a Ukrainian collapse before the election. Yeah. 
Exactly. Exactly right. All right. Uh, Putin, St. Petersburg. Yeah. Many this interesting is, things connected to, to Ukraine. Yeah. This was an enormous event. And I mean, I mean, I think before we go into, you know, the, the, the heart of it, I mean, I think this a point that I must make, which is, of course, that Putin, of course, is a presidential candidate now. He has an election coming in March. So he's been making a point. He's gone to Kaliningrad. He's been to St. Petersburg, which, remember, is his hometown. And, I mean, the, one must see some of these events as connected to the election campaign. Not that anybody has any serious doubts that he's going to win the election. But anyway, he goes to St. Petersburg. And he is there to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the lifting of the siege of Leningrad. Now, Leningrad, of course, was the name that St. Petersburg had during the Soviet period. The siege of Leningrad was one of the most terrible, harrowing events of the Second World War. When the city was surrounded by the Germans and, by the way, the Finns. They don't like to be reminded of that, but they were. The Germans and the Finns had a policy of trying to starve the city into surrender. It never surrendered. But by some estimates, 900,000 people died of hunger. I mean, it's one of the most extraordinary examples of endurance in war that there has ever been. But of course, it's caused a massive you know, psychological blow to all the people who were experienced it. Who would have included Putin's parents? I mean, they were from St. Petersburg, it's his hometown. His own brother. Uh, died during the siege. Now, this is a brother whom he never knew because um, he was born after the war. But, you know, his elder brother, Victor, died during the siege. And, of course, millions of other Russians were affected. And the siege of Leningrad, which is appallingly little known in the West, is an incredibly well-known and important um, event amongst Russians. I mean, it's one of the great stories of the Second World War, and it's one of the great tragedies of the Second World War. And of course, Leningrad never surrendered, and the siege was finally broken in uh, January 1944. And from that point on, the Russians, the Soviet Union, was held the initiative on the battlefronts. And eventually, as we know, um, its army got all the way to Berlin. So this is an enormously important, incredibly emotional um, anniversary. And Putin attended it. And of course, he had a guest who was Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus. And they attended these events together. And the fact that they attended them together, again, highlights the extent to which Belarus and Russia have now come together. And of course, just as Leningrad suffered terribly during the war, Belarus suffered terribly during the war as well. But all of this, this visit is not just a campaign event, and it's not a historical commemoration, important though the history is. Putin made a whole series of speeches. And he had certain meetings in St. Petersburg. First of all, he met with people, veterans from St. Petersburg, people who have fought in the special military operation. So he brought it up, events up to date in that way as well. But he also gave a speech at a new memorial, which has been built in St. Petersburg to commemorate the civilians in the Soviet Union who died during the Second World War, not the soldiers now, the civilians. And he made a speech, a very powerful speech, in my opinion, a very emotional speech. There is no doubt at all that Putin was acting and speaking, in my opinion, what he truly thinks and believes. And, of course, he never mentioned Ukraine specifically. I mean, he didn't really talk about Ukraine over the course of the speech, that would have been inappropriate. But when you drill into the speech, some things become immediately clear. He talks about um, how the Soviet Union 
sacrificed and fought to defeat this terrible ideology. He spoke about how the Germans during the Second World War targeted civilians. He spoke about the atrocities that they committed. He spoke about events like the Holocaust. He talked all about that. But then he spoke about, in a way that sought to bring that up to date, he spoke about historical revisionism in the West, the attempts to sugarcoat or play down the realities of the Second World War. He talked about, and then he went on to talk about, people who today have the same views as the Germans did at that time, who also take action against civilians, who bomb cities, who target civilians as well. And he spoke at length about this. And it was not difficult to work out that the people he was talking about are the authorities in Kiev. And he went on to say that just as happened during the Second World War, when the Soviet Union eradicated, and he used that word, it's in the official translation of his words, eradicated the people who held that ideology, that terrible ideology, um, at that time, in the 1940s. Today, they will do that again. Now, when someone talks like this, when he talks in this very emotional way, attending ceremonies of this kind in his own home city, himself talking about the experiences of his parents, himself referring to the fact that he lost a brother in this siege. To my mind, it's absolutely clear that emotionally, psychologically, Putin has crossed the line. He no longer has any intention of negotiating seriously with Zelensky or the people around him in Kiev. His objective now is to destroy this government in Ukraine once and for all, because he considers itself it to be the inheritors of the ideology and tradition that uh, the Soviet Union fought against and defeated in the Second World War. So I think that people have speculated about what Putin's intentions are. I think he gave us the clearest possible sign over the course of his visit to St. Petersburg that what he's now aiming for is not some kind of negotiated solution in Ukraine. It is straightforwardly victory. Okay, a final question. Do you think the Zelensky regime understands this? Do you think the collective West, Europe and the United States, understand this? And when do you think Putin changed his, his objective? Because right. yeah. for, for, the, for the beginning of the conflict, at least for like the first year, I would say that Putin's objective was a negotiated settlement. That, that's how it, how it looked. Uh, what do you think changed his, uh, his yeah. view on this? Uh, I, I forgot to mention, by the way, that I also think, I, I, I understand, I haven't seen the actual moment when he did that, but I understand that he also again referred to Odessa while in St. Petersburg as a Russian city. Just say. <laughs> now, about what Zelensky and the collective West make of all of this, I think one of the fundamental mistakes they make is that they don't take Putin seriously. I think that they assume him to be some kind of, well, yeah, they assume him to be as cynical and as calculating as they claim and as corrupt as they claim and as cynical as they themselves are. So I think that they don't understand that when Putin talks in this way, he means what he says. Uh, so I don't think that they have paid much attention to what he was saying in St. Petersburg, certainly not as much attention as we have done. Um, I don't think that any of the leaders of the West, uh, Schultz, Macron, um, Sunak, Biden, have been briefed by their intelligence agencies fully about 
what Putin said or the impact of what he said. I don't think they would understand, even if they were briefed, how important these words of Putin are, Putin's are, for understanding his deeper feelings and his thoughts about where the, the war is going. So I don't think they understand it. And of course, all of this applies to Zelensky as well. I think that they still think that, you know, if they can manage some little victory on the battlefields or tighten up the sanctions there or talk to some oligarchs here, they still think that, you know, eventually, if they push hard enough, Putin will come round to their way of thinking, or maybe they can get rid of him or something of that kind. But I don't think they understand that Putin is as serious as he is. And I don't think they understand the traction, the emotional weight that all of this carries for Russians. I think this has been the mistake they have been making all along. I mean, they've made many other mistakes, underestimating Russia's economic abilities, underestimating uh, the resilience of Russia's military. But I don't think that they understand any of this in any way at all. And I think that is one of the fundamental problems. And I think that <laughs> because they don't understand it, um, they will continue in the way that they always have, coming up with their various plans and schemes and policies for Ukraine, always doing what they have always done, which is ignore and disregard the other side's views. Now, when did Putin come to this view? Now, I think that this has been a long journey for him. But um, I think that a number of there were a number of staging posts that led to this. The first was the collapse of the Istanbul negotiations. I think that um, he saw there how utterly implacable the West was. I mean, he thought that um, he may have, he thought, I suspect other people in the Kremlin also thought that a deal could be done. And what they almost had a deal. And they saw that the West came out to wreck that deal. And they heard people like Lloyd Austin come out and say that um, the aim of the West was to weaken Russia. And they also heard Boris Johnson saying about, you know, Russia must be defeated. And at that point, not just Putin, but I think most of the Russian establishment understood that this is a war that they're in a, involved in a war, that this is an ex existential conflict, that there is not going to be a negotiated settlement with the West, that the West is every bit as implacable about Russia as, um, you know, the Russians had feared that it might be. And I think Istanbul was a very, very important staging point. But then I think the other thing that has hardened Russian views um, and it's a cumulative thing, has been these Ukrainian attacks on Russian cities, the um, assassinations within Russia, the sort of terroristic type activities that have been conducted. And they've been seeing the sort of dishonest way in which the United States has handled that, pretending that it is not involved and even disapproved even whilst it is facilitating these things. And again, I think the Russians have said to themselves, well, this is a regime that does these things. These, it's backed in doing that by the West. We can't seriously negotiate with these people. They're not just out to um, defeat us now. They've clearly got even more aggressive intentions like that. And we're getting all of these reports more and more often now about how they want to break up our country and um, basically end us not just as a great power, but as an independent power. So I think it has been a process, but I think at some point, perhaps around the time of the Prigozhin mutiny, who knows, I think Putin finally came to the view that there really isn't any point any longer in talking about talks. He's always going to say, 
Well, if people come forward with substantive proposals, we will consider them. But he doesn't any longer believe that those substantive proposals will come. And in his own mind now, he's committed to achieving full victory in Ukraine. Okay, we will end it there, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop, 15% off all t-shirts. Take care.